Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Dr. Amit Sen Gupta of Genswas Sabyan to speak about the draft pharmaceutical policy 2017. The recent pharmaceutical policy which had come up, how important is it at this juncture uh, uh, and how does it serve the accessibility and affordability of medicines to the people? We have never, uh, maybe in the last two or three decades, have had a proper pharma policy which is designed to address the issue of access. What we have are policies that try to make piecemeal changes and make piecemeal suggestions uh, over a period of time. Uh, now, uh, most of the earlier policies have really been largely about pricing, largely about uh, some aspects of quality control, etc. Uh, but the intersection with health, uh, because finally you cannot treat pharmaceuticals or medicines like you treat other consumer pro products because they are required for the health sector. And the intersection with health is never been very clear in successive pharma policies and that is why there are in important issues related to health as well as important issues related to the pharma pharmaceutical manufacturing sector as well which require to be addressed. Uh, having said that, uh, I, I think it also needs to be underlined that the current policy draft which has been publicized for comments uh, is grossly inadequate. It is almost an amateurish kind of an exercise uh, drafted by people who have little knowledge of the sector and uh, it's a very slipshod way of trying to address very important issues. At least uh, it has uh, mentioned uh, something that has uh, remained on the sidelines, uh, talked about quite openly within the industry but has not, not uh, earlier come in the policy domain, which is the uh, issue of deindustrialization in the pharmaceutical sector. Now, uh, while the policy draft does talk about it, it talks about it in such a perfunctory manner that it provides no direction or guidance to the uh, future uh, trajectory of uh, what the government wants to do in this sector. It is, an, it is today a very serious uh, matter that uh, while on one hand uh, India produces a huge amount of medicines exported also to 200 countries across the world, um, data shows that it's about the second or third largest producer of medicines by volume, but at the same time it is uh, all based on a dwindling manufacturing base. So what, what is happening in the pharmaceutical sector today is that uh, much of the finished drugs that are produced in India uh, are produced or manufactured from imported APIs, that is what's called the active pharmaceutical ingredient, which is the basic component and that is where the actual technological inputs are required. So much of the actual APIs that go into producing the finished products that are made in India uh, are imported and a bulk of that is imported from one country, which is China. Companies have stopped actually manufacturing APIs in India or reduced their API manufacturing capacity. So, uh, in, and this is largely in fact led by the big companies, which are no more manufacturing APIs, but they are importing APIs or are buying from the existing producers of API, which is the small and medium sector in India, not the large companies, and just finishing the drugs, packaging them and selling them to the market. So they are actually working as traders rather than manufacturers. So uh, even in the policy, uh, it speaks that this trading or which you are saying is getting API from other countries and making formulations uh, is being taken up by other Southeast Asian countries and someday down the lane even China might catch up. So what that, would be the situation of Indian pharmaceuticals? So that pharmaceutical? is the other, other danger that uh, exists, uh, which is that today there appears to be a division of labor in the pharmaceutical market, uh, 
uh, where China is producing a bulk of the APIs and India is producing the finished products from uh, much of this from Chinese imported APIs. Now, nothing prevents actually China in the coming years to also start making finished products in a, in a large way uh, because it's much more convenient for them because they are the ones who are making the API. Uh, and if that happens, it will be extremely difficult for the Indian pharmaceutical industry to survive in its present form uh, because currently if you look at uh, pharm the pharmaceutical market, the Indian market, the domestic market is not growing. It is not growing also primarily because uh, most of Indian drugs that are consumed in India, uh, people buy from out of their own money. Uh, it's related to the very poor investment in public health services and there is that, that is why a limit to the growth of the consumption of medicines in the domestic sector. Uh, over a period of time, how has the composition of, of the pharmaceutical industry, both the indigenous as well also the missing out of a public sector manufacturing medicines changed? While acknowledging the role of the public sector in initiating production of medicines from the basic stage in India, at the end of it says that maybe there is no further role of the public sector, which is utter nonsense. So this uh, position that the draft policy takes against restarting public sector manufacturing is essentially an ideological point that they are making based on the overall direction of uh, public policy related to economics and industrialization, which somehow for the reasons best known to them find no place for the public sector, but in India. It is IDPL and HAL, both in the public sector, which in the late 50s and early 60s started manufacturing medicines in India. Before that, medicines that were sold in India were directly imported by multinational corporations. They did not manufacture in India. It was only after public sector manufacturing started that we see both domestic companies and even multinational corporations starting to manufacture within India. That is the historic role that public sector manufacturing has done. Also in the past we used to see ratios for companies to manufacture a ratio of their production in API which is the main raw. So earlier and what you had uh, was uh, uh, mechanisms to ensure that companies don't only sell finished products, that they should be also involved in manufacturing those. So precisely to guard against the situation today, you had what were called ratio parameters. That is, that if you were producing an X amount of medicines or you were selling X amount of medicines, then you were compelled to at least manufacture Y amount of medicines in your plants, in your own plants. Today what has happened is that most big companies have closed down their own plants, multinational and big Indian, and are buying from small and medium scale sectors through the medium of what is called loan licensing or they are importing from other countries including as we were saying China. So the policy does mention that loan licensing which is uh, what you have raised has to be phased out in a manner. What is your opinion about that? So that suggestion? is a correct position that loan licensing, but the only thing is that when they say phased out, we don't know how long that is going to take. The, loan li the whole loan licensing system when it was introduced decades back, it was supposed to be in uh, existence only for three years. And there have been several decades and we have continued to uh, have that, uh, have that uh, provision in place, uh, which basically means that if you want to be a big pharmaceutical player uh, with a large presence in the market, you don't need to manufacture anything. You can, a small company or a medium sized company can license to you its existing capacity. That's why that's, or loan to you its existing capacity. That is, what's, that is what is meant by loan licensing. Uh, so while the policy does men mention loan licensing, uh, I think the problem is that it's, it, it is a half-hearted uh, provision in the policy and we are not very sure how 
they are going to really follow up on this because there are powerful interests in the big pharma industry who are today not interested in manufacturing because today the main profits to be made is the huge margins between manufacturing cost and the selling price because the so it's almost the, in, in many medicines it's the difference is 1 is to 10 the manufacturing make of, of a drug may cost 10 rupees and sells at 100 rupees so because of that margin uh, there is little interest in reducing the manufacturing cost and the manufacturers actually uh, do not make that kind of pro profit it is the tra it, it is the sellers who are making that profit so to put it crudely it is much more lucrative to be a trader or a seller in the market of the finished product than to be an actual manufacturer. Uh, coming to the quality of medicines, the policy says that uh, bioavailability and bioequivalence tests have to be mandatory in the future uh, to see that the medicines are of good quality. What is your opinion on that? There has been an earlier government committee has, which has given an opinion on, on this Ranjit Rai Chaudhary committee, which had clearly uh, said and that holds true even today, uh, it was a few years back that to ensure quality you do not have to insist on bioequivalence and bioavailability. Essentially bioavailability and bioequivalence are ways in which you can show that uh, the actual presence of your drug in the body is at the same level as it is for the originator company. Because in India almost all manufacturers are making what are called generic medicines which are copies of the original medicine. Now, uh, in case of most medicines, you don't need that. You don't need to actually show by tests on human subjects that the exact levels of the chemical that is produced by the original drug is also produced by the generic drug. You can do that uh, much more cheaply uh, by having what are called GMP norms in place, good manufacturing norms. So if your process, you can show that my, your process is good enough to produce that drug of a, of a certain quality and equivalent to the quality of the originated drug, then that's something that, is, uh, that should be enough. So the problem of quality in, uh, in, in the industry is not this. The problem of quality in the industry is good manufacturing practices are not adhered to. There are, aren't enough inspectors, there aren't enough mechanisms to ensure that these uh, norms are actually followed. And sitting on top of all that, you have huge levels of corruption. So you have one an underfunded regulatory agency with few laboratories, too few inspectors and corruption. So that is what is needed to be addressed rather than adding another layer of quality control which for most drugs is not required. For a few sensitive drugs you may require bioavailability and bioequivalence uh, kind of studies. While talking about uh, strict quality uh, measures, it does not talk of exactly about irrational medicines which are coming up and are being given permission in thousands. Every, uh, as See, we go, that is again to? related to the anarchy that prevails in the drug regulatory mechanism. Now this has been pointed out by umpteen committees uh, including parliamentary committees and the government's own committees uh, of the high prevalence of irrational medicines especially combinations meaning that these are medicines which are unscientific do not have any medical relevance. In some cases they, they can be actually harmful. We know that. We know that there are something like almost 100,000 different formulations produced by companies. Most of them can be weeded out and that would actually ease the various procedures of drug regulation. But unfortunately, as you are correctly pointing out, this policy does not uh, really address how that is going to be done, how you can have mechanisms in place that can do this uh, periodically. Uh, and uh, thereby almost misses this whole area that requires attention. Extending it to the generic medicines argument, Prime Minister of India had some time back even told that every doctor in the country needs to compulsorily prescribe generic medicine, which is the chemical name. 
but there doesn't seem to be and they have specified in the policy that it is restricted to the public sector and also there don't seem to be any regulatory mechanisms for this see contrary to some beliefs uh, the prime minister's pronouncement itself uh, does not uh, become implementable just because the prime minister has pronounced it unfortunately even if he or, or others may believe so and one of the prime examples is the declaration on generic medicines now the concept of generic medicines that is using the scientific name rather than the brand name when doctors are writing prescriptions is a correct concept it, it is a scientific concept but for that to actually be implemented the, that notion to be implemented you need mechanisms on the ground including for example the availability of medicines that are sold in generic names yes. now the problem is for many doctors uh, ethical doctors if they write in generic names that medicine will not be available in the shops because companies do not produce uh, medicines by generic names and why don't they produce medicines by generic names because the whole business model of the pharmaceutical industry in India is built around unethical promotion that it doesn't matter what you are producing what matters is how much money you are putting into promotion in order to persuade doctors to write your drugs and in order for you to do that you need your own brand it is only then that your promotional uh, avenues will work there has been also criticism that the research and development and also about patents and how the flexibilities uh, which india has or any other country has to deal with uh, patents has not been addressed yeah so extent. again it has been only i think in a couple of lines it has been mentioned uh, but uh, the main issue uh, is that we are now seeing a lot of new medicines especially medicines for chronic diseases like cancers uh, which are being introduced in the global market which are under patent protection but because we changed our law in 2005 uh, we can't our companies cannot automatically start producing them uh, but to address that we have provisions in our in our patent act uh, which uh, can allow Indian companies to produce patented medicines in India, provided the, uh, the government issues what are called compulsory licenses. Now, there are maybe almost 100 new drugs of uh, varying uh, use value, which have been introduced in the last decade since we changed our patent law. But we have only issued one compulsory license. So clearly, there is both on the side of the government there is a reluctance to issue a compulsory license when there is a public health need and this is borne out by various uh, pronouncements of the government. That is reflected in the policy that it does not in, with any seriousness talk about how the health safeguards including compulsory license in the pharmaceutical policy uh, drop, uh, in, in our Indian Patent Act will be actually implemented to allow better access to new medicines in India. In the context of using flexibilities and uh, R&D, India is usually seen as very vocal in the global scenario. Uh, you know, other countries even look up to India, but the situation when you see, and India even speaks about flexibilities in forums like WHO on a very regular basis. But when you see it in the other way, when, uh, when it comes to the national policies, there seems to be a dichotomy. Yes, because what we are seeing now is a shift from the earlier stance of the 1990s, when India used to say that we have been forced to uh, agree to a patent regime that allows for product patents, to now saying, and that is reflected in uh, various policies related to patents, to now saying that patents are good for us. So that is a shift that is reflected in policy as well. The extreme reluctance to use uh, the provisions of the Indian Patent Act to break patents on new medicines and make available at lower cost medicines to the uh, people in India. Market based pricing had been implemented from 2012. So there doesn't seem to be any change in the way this pricing is being looked at. See the battle on pricing was lost in 2012 when the shift took place from 
what was uh, earl the earlier norm, which was fixing prices based on manufacturing cost to a market-based pricing, right? Which basically means that you base your ceiling prices of regulated drugs on what the existing prices in the market are. Now, our earlier discussion clearly shows that the market is rigged. The market is rigged by promotional practices, right? Uh, so, obviously, market-based pricing favors the pharmaceutical industry and the ceiling prices that the uh, National Pharmaceutical Pricing Authority sets are in a way quite meaningless because they are already inflated by the market. Uh, so, unless you can talk about going back to the earlier norm of setting ceiling prices based on the manufacturing cost. Uh, the discussions on pricing are in a way infructuous. In fact, if you look at the draft policy in the substantive part, half of the discussion is on various things that the NPPA is going to do, yes. the pricing authority is going to do. Now, all of that is actually skirmishes on the fringes because the main battle, which was about shift from the cost-based pricing to market-based pricing, uh, was uh, decided upon in 2012. Uh, so, so it's a, it's it's in a way a smoke screen, uh, um, trying to justify that we are doing something to regulate prices when actually you are not. So, in fact, there have been pronouncements uh, concurrently uh, that over a period the government will no more set ceiling prices, but will only monitor the market. So, a further uh, sort of giving up to the virtues of the market to set prices is what we are moving towards and this uh, policy also in a way uh, is designed to try to move towards that kind of a situation. Uh, and uh, that is something that the pharmaceutical industry will be very happy with. If you really look at the reactions to the draft policy, the pharma industry is quite happy with this policy because it's a no policy, it's a non-policy. There is nothing, there is no meat in the suggestions, nothing that is implementable and so things will continue as they are. So basically uh, in, earlier this year we just had national health policy. Does any of the, the can you draw any parallels between both of these? No, much, most of, the, I mean both policies in, in, in the sense are one designed to continue uh, the reliance on the market to set prices, to set access and reduce the level at which the government intervenes. That's basically what I would say would be common to both. So uh, this is what was the discussion on draft pharmaceutical policy. Thank you Dr. Amit Sen Gupta for joining us.